ビデオ Okay, so normally at the start of these videos, I would talk about a subject I could tangentially tie into the subject of said video as a means to provide a better understanding of the subject or as a means to frame my own thoughts. Instead, I'll just summarize the cold open to the first episode of today's anime. So we open in Washington, D.C. with the White House on full alert. Secret Service is dragging the half asleep President of the United States to safety as we pan up to see what exactly the big threat is. We see a man who's dressed as an 18th century samurai standing on top of the roof with his arms crossed and a serious expression on his face. The most notable thing about him is that he has an elect heater on his back, an early static electrical generator from Japan. Then he does this. <laughs> After that Independence Day reenactment, the samurai calmly floats down to the cowering president and asks him if the building he just blew up was the Library of Congress. The president sputters out the word no before wetting himself. The samurai begins to walk off as the president asks him who exactly is he? And he responds with... Ejin. And that is your opening for the 2001 OVA, Read or Die. Based off a series of light novels, the OVA for Read or Die is probably one of its more well-known adaptations. Taking place in an alternate history where the sun never fully set on the British Empire, the world is kept in balance by the intelligence agency known as the British Library. The series follows one of the library's secret field agents, Yomiko Reedman. Yomiko, despite not looking like it, is a very capable agent and a valuable asset to the library thanks to her superpower, which allows her to manipulate paper and paper material to her will, thus earning her the not-so-creative codename, The Paper. The Read or Die series is the brainchild of writer Hideyuki Karada. Now, Karada is mostly known for his work in screenwriting anime. He has written and adapted some of the biggest animes in the past 20 years, as well as its hidden gems. But the Reader Die series is his and his alone. He is the author of the original light novels, he is the author of both the manga adaptation and its spinoff, and yes, he did write the screenplay to this OVA. This franchise is his baby, and you can tell he puts great care into constructing this world, its characters, and its story because this anime is awesome. Not just in action, but just in the way it is constructed. And considering how it was released when the OVA market was in its last years of relevancy, it's amazing Read or Die came out as good as it did. To me, Read or Die is one of the forgotten classics of the early 2000s. But what exactly makes Read or Die so good? The action? The story? The characters? Well, I guess we'll have to look closely and read into it to find out, huh? Huh? Now first off, boy has this anime not aged today. The colors are bright without being saturated, character designs are striking and unique without looking exaggerated, and the action set pieces are really, really good. Like, not only do you have samurai blowing up white houses, but you got mechanized grasshoppers destroying Tokyo, ancient Buddhist monks parting the rivers of India, and a 19th century glider doing aerial bombardments of New York City in 2001. Oof. But it's all animated beautifully. Studio Dean knew where to put all that OVA money and made all the action scenes feel big and important. Let's do it. Be careful, okay? But the best part of nearly all the action scenes is how Yomiko's paper powers are animated. Every sheet of paper is animated with such care so as to show off the capabilities of Yomiko's power. Depending on the scene, paper is drawn to look hard as steel, sharp as blades, or fluttering in the breeze. The directors knew that paper would be a big part of this anime and made sure that it would look the best. <laughs> Ah! 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 
kind of hard to believe that in a few years, Studio Dean would gain a kind of overblown, yet not entirely unearned reputation for cutting corners. Story-wise, the OVA is entirely self-contained. The entire focus of the plot is centered around a singular mission, to find what the plot of the Egen is and to foil that plot. The anime never loses sight of that mission. Everything introduced into the story from characters to settings to plot is entirely relevant to the main story. So if you do wonder why we don't see a flashback of Yomiko joining the British Library or why we don't get an explanation for Yomiko or her partner Nancy's special abilities, the answer is simple. Those pieces of information aren't relevant to the story. We don't get bogged down by unnecessary details of the how and the why. We're introduced to these characters, their given personality, and how they fit into the story as a whole. If I had any criticism for the story, however, it would have to be the villains. Now, on one hand, the Ejin are entertaining concepts that are executed quite well. Genetically modified clones of historical figures that have powers, abilities, and weaponry based on what made them historically noteworthy. Having aviation pioneer Otto Lilienthal fight using a super-powered hang glider, or having famed entomologist Jean-Henri Fabry being a weird bug mutant who can control giant insects, is a unique idea that is handled quite well. It makes you want to know what the abilities of the other Ejin are, and how they relate to their corresponding histories. On the other hand, the Ejin don't exactly feel like fully realized characters. They feel more like bosses our heroes have to fight than actual characters in a story. And while this method of characterization does lead to some pretty awesome action scenes, it doesn't really give a reason as to why the rest of the Ejin are so fanatically loyal to carrying out the head Ejin's plot. Speaking of, the head Ejin, who is a clone of Japanese Zen Buddhist poet Ikkyu Sojin, isn't all that compelling of a villain. He mostly just comes off as a snide asshole who has all his other historical lackeys doing most of the heavy lifting. And his motivation for his villainy isn't exactly the most original motivation ever conceived. This grand vision is a judgment of man's soul, the karmic cleansing of mankind. Humanity is violent and corrupt and selfish, therefore they are unworthy of life and I must wipe them clean from the face of the- Yeah, 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 you and every other JRPG villain, buddy. I think one good thing I can say about EQ is that he makes sense from a thematical standpoint as a proper villain for Yomiko to fight, a Japanese bibliophile being forced to square up against one of Japan's greatest literary figures. But I feel like it's handled with a light touch. Yomiko is certainly disappointed that a writer of such beautiful poetry would become such a monster, you used to be such a gentleman who understood the value of love. Why are you doing this? My love exists in another life. Serenity was a state more suited to the past. This time, I have a chance to apply my genius to the canvas of the earth. No more silly poems for me. That's no reason to punish everyone else. But they don't dwell on that factor too much when compared to, well, we'll get to that later. One unique feature of Reader Die as an anime is its genre. The Reader Die franchise is, at its heart, a spy thriller. This is noteworthy because spy fiction anime is quite rare. Most anime thrillers tend to focus on assassins taking down a target, or a detective trying to track down a killer, or an every man or every woman caught up in a vast conspiracy that they need to unravel. By comparison, anime thrillers that have a focus on espionage could easily be counted on one hand. Aside from this anime, Darker Than Black, 0091, Princess Principal, and Night Wraith 1931, what else is there? <sighs> Maybe... I think the main reason why spy fiction and anime is so few and far between is that spy fiction is a very British genre. Proto-spy novels such as The Scarlet Pimpernel and The Prisoner of Zenda are of British origins. Most of the writers that created the tropes that spy fiction is built on, such as Ian Fleming, Jean Le Carre, and Graham Greene, are all Englishmen. And the most well-known spy film series as well as spy television series both originate in Britain. I bring this up because while Japan and the United Kingdom have had good relations ever since World War II ended, their cross-cultural exchange is not as deep when compared to the likes of Germany or... France or the United States, so it makes it all the more amazing that Karada not only took on a genre with its roots in jolly old England, but also took jolly old England along for the ride. It's apparent that Karada is familiar with a lot of the spy media of the United Kingdom because Read or Die is just dripping with British culture. Wendy, <laughs> fetch us some tea. Yes, sir. Of course, right on it. 
Despite its multicultural cast, it plays out like a British spy story, right down to Taku Iwasaki's soundtrack which has a very Bond-esque sound with how it weaves dramatical orchestra strings with lounge-style compositions. The world revolves around Britain in this universe, they are the problem solvers. Every competent person in this universe, regardless of nationality, work for the British Library and by extension, the British government. The British Library is portrayed as cool-headed even when things aren't going exactly as planned. Unlike the American government who is led by a president who is an obvious Bush XP who constantly freaks out, wets himself, and is shown to be perfectly fine with throwing countless soldiers into a meat grinder if that means taking out a threat. And can you believe this OVA came out in May of 2001? But it's not like this anime is trying to make Great Britain look like this powerful god nation. It's more like they are just trying to follow how things are supposed to be in a British spy thriller. When we are not focused on Yomiko and her team, we are focused on her commander Joker and his team. They are giving out orders, creating plans on the fly, sending in reinforcements, uncovering any relevant intelligence and feeding it to Yomiko out in the field. There's even an element of politics to it. In between running the mission, the command is simultaneously calling the leaders of other nations, asking for assistance and giving reassurance, while also making doubly sure very little information about this operation gets in the hands of the media. It's what a spy thriller is supposed to be. A mixture of action, suspense, and mystery, and it does all three very well. All we need now is a suave secret agent man to tie it all together. But we do not have that, thank God. Let me just come out and say that the main reason why Read or Die is so good is because of this little cutie right here. Yomiko Reedman, whose name literally translates to Read Girl Read Man, is one of the most underrated female protagonists in anime. There's an idea of what we expect from a female spy. You know, the Hollywood ideal. The tall, glamorous vamp clad in cat suit and stilettos. The strength of a green beret crammed into a body of a Milan supermodel can triple backflip over a laser grid with a look on her face that says, I am incredibly sexy on top of being very bored. And then there's Yomiko. You truly do shine when you're surrounded by books, Agent Paper. Well, thank you, sir. Of course, apart from that, you're rather hopeless. Huh? Oh. Yomiko makes read or die. The anime would suffer if it was in the hands of any other type of protagonist. And the reason for that is because Yomiko represents the perfect antithesis of what we expect a spy thriller protagonist is, while still being a capable spy thriller protagonist. She's smart, thinks on her feet, resourceful, and refuses to back down in the face of adversity. She's also soft-spoken, exceedingly polite, and certainly has her head in the clouds 80% of the time. <laughs> Would you please give me my book back? Oh, and she loves books. Have you gathered that she loves books? Subtle character trait, I know. Von Arnhem's letters to the assembly. Oh! Oh, they've got Mundus Symbolicus. Oh! They've got the guest of Hemingway. She is like a kindly young librarian who is given superpowers and sent off into the field. Even when her life depends on it, that polite demeanor will not be shaken. Her animation also says a lot about her. Her abilities at using her powers might start off graceful at first, but if the fight ends up going hand to hand or she just wants the fight to be over, her motions become a lot clumsier. There's nothing graceful about her movements. Compared to a seasoned soldier like her partners Drake and Nancy, Yomiko's movement emphasizes the fact that she gets by less on her strength and more on her skills. And that is what makes her a good character. These are the traits that make Yomiko Reedman such a relatable protagonist. Even with her superpowers, she still feels very human and approachable. She's not some underdeveloped catsuit and stiletto style secret agent who approaches every situation with a kick to the jaw followed by a wry quip. She's just a messy nerd who adores books, who happens to be a secret agent. Plus, come on, she's just cute as a button. But not only is Yomiko a strong character, she also has a very strong relationship with her assigned partner, Nancy. Their dynamic is a classic clash of characterization, Yomiko being the sweet, idealistic, frumpy nerd, and in contrast to the more cynical Nancy and her more conventional attractiveness and cleavage-exposing catsuits. 
Naturally, this relationship is rocky from the start with Nancy not believing in Yomiko's abilities and just seeing her as a liability. But over time, thanks to Yomiko's abilities to prove herself and both of them saving each other's lives over the course of the anime, their relationship blossoms into not just one of mutual respect, but of genuine friendship. I always give these bookmarks to my friends. And I'd like to think that you and I have become friends. Yeah. Thanks, I'm sure I'll use it. Even if you don't, it's still good luck, and if you use it with the romance novel, it'll bring you true love. The relationship honestly becomes the heart and soul of the anime, the true focus of it, and thanks to it being so well executed, it makes it all the more shocking and devastating when Nancy pulls a top 10 anime betrayals and reveals that she's also an Ejin. But even after all that, Yomiko still sees her as a friend. When she breaks into the Ejin base to stop their world-ending plot, she firmly believes that by stopping the plan, she can talk some sense into Nancy along the way. You could chalk this up to complete and utter naivety on Yomiko's part, but the anime does not shy away by saying this could be a hopeless endeavor because Nancy's allegiances to the Ejin might be stronger than Yomiko thinks. Don't compare me to that traitorous bitch. You know my heart belongs only to you and the each. Of course, this is all solved by the fact that the Nancy that betrayed Yomiko was an evil clone, and the real Nancy shows up to help Yomiko out and ends up having a kick-ass cat fight with her clone, and everything's all good. At least that's what I'll say so far. I don't want to get too far into spoiler territory now. And the reason why I don't want to spoil the entire ending for you is because I really want more people to see Reader die. It was regarded as a classic of the early 2000s for a time, but hasn't received enough recognition these days thanks to the DVD being out of print. I honestly wish I could tell you more about the Reader Die series, but I haven't really read any of the original novels because they are hard to track down. And the TV series? Well, let's just say that video is a ways away. But it's worth your while to go track down and check it out. Especially if you want an anime full of great action set pieces, books, and the lovable anime girls who love them. Thank you so much, Miss D. Nancy. Nancy Makahari. But I thought you said... <laughs> no, it's all right. I don't really like my code name. It sounds like a porn star. I'm Yomiko. Yomiko Reedman. I know.